Did you know that God's Learning Channel is available on a wide variety of different platforms? For starters, GLC can be watched in parts of Texas, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Colorado by cable or antenna. GLC is also available to watch in our Galaxy 19 direct-to-home satellite equipment throughout North America with no subscription fees. Great for viewers in rural areas with no internet connection. Our free broadcast and program archives are available via 24-7 web streaming on our website at glctv.tv. For our online friends, GLC Radio and Audio Podcast are available for free streaming throughout iTunes, TuneIn, or Shoutcast on your computer or mobile device. Likewise, our YouTube channel contains hundreds of free video clips that you can easily share with your friends and family. You can also watch our live broadcast from program archives of your favorite episodes directly on your television with an affordable subscription-free device called Roku, containing thousands of channels to choose from. We urge our viewers to take advantage of these various ways to watch or listen to GLC, and we ask that you spread the word to your friends and family. We can't continue to grow without your help. Well, praise God and welcome to Monday's Roundup. Monday, I saw the hat and it made me think of Roundup. <laughs> um, what is that hat here for? That hat is here because today's the day. We're drawing for the first of these books today. Mm -hmm. Got pretty much. We nice. have a few. You sure yeah, do? I have some from um, Canada in here as well. Awesome. Really? So, yep. So, I'm just really glad that, that people are enjoying the teachings on the Sabbath. They've been you know okay awesome. so i love to read it is like my very favorite thing me to do too. and i'm really grateful the lord has just had me i haven't hardly been able to put the bible down for the past 10 days mm -hmm. it's just been this constant thing but the other day i picked up a book that was sent to me from ffoz i'll be sharing with you about that because we'll definitely be carrying this one in the bookstore it's one uh, by Daniel Lancaster. He's one of the guys who teaches on uh, both of the programs that right. we are on here. And um, it is just a fabulous book. He gives some, some history, some really great brief history of how the church was separated. Really? And then one of the things I was reading in there last night, I was so incredibly impressed with. Well, you know, over in Acts 15, um, that's where the leading members of the early church, we'll mm -hmm. put it that way. Mm -hmm. um, James, the brother of Yeshua, Yaakov was actually his name. All of those leaders, and, and they're trying to decide what these Gentile believers who, they're this really strange phenomenon that has happened. They're, they're trying to decide what they should do be uh what's required what's required mm -hmm. for them to do and he does something very interesting in this book he quotes some messianic rabbis some believing rabbis from the 1800s as well as really? a couple of rabbis who read the new testament they were not believers but according to jewish law They looked at Acts 15 to see what those guys had had to say about what the Gentile believers needed to be doing. They said they got it right on the mark. Good. And these weren't believing rabbis. Right. These were Jewish not messianic. rabbis. Not mm -hmm. not right, right, not messianic rabbis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not believing in Yeshua rabbis, I right. would say. Yeah. So it's an incredibly interesting book, and I can hardly wait to get that in the bookstore and be talking to you about that but in the meantime pop will you do the honors pull the first winner okay now what do they get they get they're, that book they're getting Just this that book. book that's what this drawing is all about and if you want your name in the pot for next week and well, well it'll get added because everybody who's in here already stays uh, in there you s oh no it's they conserved <laughs> i don't believe it Amy, not your name, is it? Why would I put my name in the hat? <laughs> I'm the one donating them. This is the Edelmans from Ponce Coop, Canada. Really? How about British that? Columbia. How so, about yay, that? congratulations. We'll get that sent out to you. I know for a fact that they placed an online order, uh -huh. and that order has not been mailed out. And, you know, I have to, to tell you that sometimes the Lord just tells me things, and, Look, there's other names in here. 
But he told me, don't send out their package until you do that drawing. And I'm like, okay. So, so Jerry keeps asking me for a check to do postage, and I keep avoiding her. Now she'll know why. <laughs> That's cool. Uh, it so is. congratulations. Yes, congratulations. I hope you love that book as much as I've loved that book. All right. Tell them how they get their name in the pot for next week. They, well, our initial thing order? was a $10 purchase from the bookstore or a $10 donation. Mm -hmm. So that'll get your name in the, in the pot. But you have, you have to tell them. To ask. You have to tell them that mm -hmm. you want your name in the drawing. Yes. Because not everybody is ready to learn about the Shabbat yet. Mm -hmm. They're not. So whenever I come on on Fridays and I'm telling you great things of, about the Lord's Sabbath, they turn it off. <laughs> or nothing. maybe not. No. I hope not. I it's kind of like at our house at dinner. You're always telling your dad what, and your mom, especially your dad who cannot read those things, what it says. And I appreciate it. It makes me appreciate those books. There's some, there's pretty great books. Yeah. Yeah. So what happens when I get really excited about something that I'm reading? I run to the other end of the house. <laughs> I'm glad she does because I don't get a chance to read them anyway. Okay. Why don't you read your letter? Well, it's a great letter. It is a very great letter. And I have a comment or two in it. It comes from <laughs> Sam in Mark, Texas. He says, praise the Lord, folks. God is some kind of God. good. This is our monthly donation for your ministry. It is true. It is tr it is a true privilege to give to the Lord's works through your ministry. Sorry, my glasses aren't working good today. It's not my eyes; it's the glasses. <laughs> we have been with you for several years. Now and are always blessed. We get you on Galaxy 19 and Internet. I miss talking to Milton as he helped me some several times with problems. Hey, Mark, let me tell you, we got a new guy in the house who took his place, and he knows these satellites better than our old buddy. Well, Milton used to do satellite installations, mm -hmm. and we're not doing that because we're not selling satellite dishes. Right. But Randall is uh, very, very helpful. In fact, he pointed out something today that, you know, I had never really thought about. It's like, okay, we encourage everybody, it, you can get us on Roku. So get you a Roku box. Well, on new televisions, hi, I own one that I bought at like two or three years ago. And there's this little icon that says Roku on it. That's all you need. You don't have to have a Roku box. And boy, oh, did really? I feel like a ninny when he told me that. I'm like, you already have it uh, built in. Randall knew that? Yes. Good for Randall. Well, anyhow, Mark, <laughs> there you go. And Sam. Okay. All right. Let's see. We live 18 miles east of Waco on Texas 164. We are senior citizens and Al, you have about nine years on me. Over the years, I have heard you speak of some of your travels and sounds as if we were in several of the same places. My wife and her aunt met both of you while they were <clears throat> stuffing envelopes here back in 2008. Wow. That's, that's a while back. Yeah, but that's interesting. They came up here to mm -hmm. do that. They missed Amy. I wasn't here. Yes, yeah, she wasn't here yet. During my sabbatical. In, in between. Just wanted to drop you a line to let you know for sure that each of you are highly favored of God, our Savior, and bountifully blessed. Keep the faith, keep looking up, and be ready for if you won't be for it won't be long. I agree hallelujah. with that. Yeah, hallelujah. Right. Now may each of you be filled to overflowing with the love of Jesus our Lord is and is our prayer for you in his love. Sam and Ray. Raynell. Raynell, okay. Of Mark. Mm -hmm. Praise God. Thank That's you. That's a great letter. Yes, it was. And I just want to thank you for praying for us because, indeed, his joy has been overflowing. We are bouncing mm -hmm. off the walls with joy. <laughs> and also, if any of you are having Galaxy 19 problems with some of the satellites, 
that we sold you called Randall. I've never seen somebody catch on so quickly. Well, what Randall does when he doesn't know, he falls on his face before God. Yes, mm -hmm. he does. Because he knows God pretty well, knows everything. <laughs> so. And he does pray a lot. Yeah. Yes, he does. He's, okay. he's a joy to have around. Um, you know, where he fits into this team so well, he's a team player. He, he, he does the satellite stuff for us. So he he's, he's working. He's part of the conversion. He does all of our maintenance for us. And that's from big to small things. Today, he's in the office helping Monica. Well, and, he runs and you camera. know what they're doing? Yeah, they're do. working on the year-end contribution receipt letters. So the letters can go yeah. in the mail. This week. <laughs> this week. They, yeah, Monica is hoping that they will be in the mail Wednesday. Okay. Right. So there's quite a few. And it's, they have to be very cautious that's not something you can just zip through because that's they print right. the envelopes they print the letters and the letters have to match the envelopes yes they do so they're being very careful but <laughs> it's just great to have yet another glc member who is willing to do whatever you ask mm -hmm. that's right well, okay my devotional today um is that it's called goliath had a brother and it's adapted from francis Pre francis frangapane's book spiritual discernment and the mind of Christ. Here's the scene. You're in a battle against sickness, oppression, or some similar struggle. You seek God, and in some way, the grace of God touches your life. Your victory may have come through a word of prayer or some other encouragement, but you absolutely know the Lord has delivered you. Using the five smooth stones of divine grace, you defeated your Goliath. But then, a few weeks or months or perhaps years later, all the old symptoms suddenly return with a vengeance. If you were struggling with an illness, it manifests worse than ever. If your battle was regarding a relationship or a particular sin, it seems as though all progress has been lost. You're back to square one. Have you ever been there? <laughs> These negative experiences can drain the faith from your heart. You lose the anticipation and power of faith, and the spiritual paralysis immobilizes your soul. You may still attend church, but your faith is unresponsive. When others testify of deliverance, you worry secretly that they too will, quote, lose their healing. For many, the result is one of faith-shaking disillusionment. Scripture says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. That's Proverbs 13:12. This heart sickness is a spiritual disease that can cripple your walk with God. Remember, faith is the substance of the things you hope for. If you lose hope, your faith becomes hollow. How can you trust God when it seems as though he let you down? You wonder, did I lose my breakthrough or was I only deceiving myself and never really had it? Dear one, it's very possible that what you're experiencing is not a loss of God's blessing, but an entirely new spiritual battle. This new war is a very clever and effective deception that Satan uses to try to worm his way back into the lives of those delivered by God. I'd been praying about this very thing, this recurring battle, when the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart. He said, Goliath had a brother. I was immediately reminded of David's war against the Philistines' giant. We all know that David became a great hero by trusting God and defeating Goliath. However, things changed as we see in 2 Samuel 21, which says, Now when the Philistines were at war again with Israel, David went down and his servants with him, and as they fought against the Philistines, David became weary. Then Ishbi Banab, who was among the descendants of the giant, intended to kill David. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, helped him and struck the Philistine and killed him. That's 2 Samuel 21, 15 through 17. Years after David conquered Goliath as a lad, after he became king, he had to face other giants. In fact, 1 Chronicles 20, verse 5 reveals that at least one of those warring against David was the brother of Goliath, and four were his children. 
2 Samuel 21, 22. We can imagine that these giants, being Goliath's kin, looked like Goliath, boasted like him, dressed like him, and probably even smelled like him. <laughs> the scripture says that while fighting one of the descendants of Goliath, David became weary. The Bible is silent as to what might have been going through the king's mind as he battled these giants. Perhaps he wondered, I thought I killed Goliath. What's he doing back? But Goliath had not come back. He was dead. David had was actually fighting the giant's kin. It just looked like the same battle. Likewise, you also have had many successful victories. Just because the current giant you are facing looks like the one you defeated in the past, do not accept the lie that you never really won the first battle. By the strength of God's grace, you trusted the Almighty and conquered your Goliath. The first giant is dead. Satan is masquerading as your former enemy so he can slip past your shield of faith and thus regain entrance into your life. Resist him. Do not accept the lie that you were never delivered. Stand in faith. Faith is a victory that overcomes the world, according to 1 John 5, 4. The living God who helped you conquer Goliath will empower you to overcome his brother as well. And here's a prayer. Father, I come to you as your servant. Like David, I have become weary with fighting an enemy I thought I had defeated. By the power of your Holy Spirit, however, I expose the lie that this is the same foe I previously conquered. In Jesus' name, I rebuke the enemy. I ask you, Lord, to send angels to strengthen me supernaturally, just as angels often strengthen Jesus. In the name of the Lord, amen. You know what that reminds me of? <laughs> Your lecture to me. Lecture? <laughs> I don't lecture you. You're my father. No, you, you lecture me. Go read your book, Daddy. <laughs> Rehearse your miracles. Yeah. yeah. That's what that was. You know, uh, something that's interesting about this, even though David had become weary and he couldn't fight that Goliath, the, the man who killed Goliath's brother in this, Abishah, was actually David's nephew, the son of David's sister. Mm-hmm. And when I look at that story, I go, okay, you know what? When David killed Goliath, he sparked so much faith throughout Israel. That's what happened. And so when Abishah was confronted with Goliath's brother, who was just as big, he slew him mm -hmm. because he knew, he knew it could be done. Mm -hmm. And that's what we <laughs> have to remember, that every right. time that God gives each of us individually a victory, it's encouraging to someone else. And that's why we are um, required of God to share our testimony, mm -hmm. and to that's, build faith. Mm -hmm. And that's why you tell me to go read my book. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I, you know, Dad, I've been around, I've been around you all my life. Have you really? I have my entire life. And I have, <laughs> I have seen God do a lot of really amazing things for you. Yeah, and I'm happy to say I've seen God do some pretty amazing things for me, too. Amen. And I'm happy to report that having you guys as my parents has been quite the little faith builder. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this first story is pretty short. It comes from the Associated Press. Twitter says it's now using spam fighting technology to seek out and automatically flag accounts that might be promoting terrorist activity. Mm. The company announced on Friday in a tweet that it has suspended more than 125,000 accounts on its social media mm. site for threatening or promoting terrorist acts, mainly related to the Islamic State group, in the last eight months. Wow. 125,000 in eight months. Would that just be in this country, I wonder? Oh, wow. I, I would think Twitter is kind of worldwide, but I don't worldwide. know. I mean, the yeah. news signals, what do you know? This country only? Worldwide, yeah. Okay, the news, this news signals a move toward automation as the U.S. government has pressured social media companies to respond more aggressively to reports of abuse. A human still reviews flagged post. And FYI, child pornography is automatically flagged for human review using a separate technology. Good. Amen. 125,000 <laughs> in eight months. My, my, my. That's terrible. 
But it's good news. They're doing it something is. about it finally. That's right. And this article comes from Israel Hayom, a uh, new face of terrorism. The recent wave of Palestinian terrorism in Israel no longer seems like a short-lived violent episode, but rather like something that's here to stay for the foreseeable future. A dangerous evolution in the recent surge of violence is lur lurking ahead as terror cells take over for lone wolves and mass casualty means of assault replaces knives. Last Wednesday, the violence took a new disturbing and dangerous turn. The attack near Jerusalem's Damascus Gate, which killed border policeman, woman, policewoman, Corporal Hadar Cohen, and wounded another border policewoman, means the next phase of hostilities, major terrorist attacks, may be lurking just around the corner. Until now, terrorist attacks were the work of lone wolves. Individuals who woke up one day and for a myriad of reasons known only to them and compounded by the Palestinian Authority's incessant incitement, they decided they'd kill a Jew. In the absence of organizational infrastructure, logistical resources and funds, these individuals use basic unsophisticated weapons, carrying out stabbing attacks and, you know, the occasional car ramming attack. These measures have proven lethal, but for the most part, they only allow the terrorists to harm a small number of Israelis prior to being neutralized. Wednesday's attack was a different story. It was not the work of a lone wolf who, barring preliminary indication, is almost impossible to stop, but the work of a group, one that had to, had to plan its moves prior to carrying out their nefarious plan. It was not limited to improvised crude weapons, but included automatic weapons, pipe bombs with m mass casualty potential, and its target was not one of the checkpoints near the terrorist hometown of uh, Guabatia. It was Jerusalem, chosen, no doubt, to maximize the impact, both figurative and literally. Mass casualty attacks are what Hamas has been trying to orchestrate for the past few months, so far to no success. Pressured by its own operatives in the Gaza Strip and by its Turkey-based headquarters, Hamas is frantically trying to establish infrastructure in Judea and Samaria and East Jerusalem in order to abduct and kill Israelis. The organization's attempts to sink its claws into both areas have recently been thwarted before taking any tangible shape. But Israel Sheen Bet's security agency's working assumption is that Hamas has not given up and that it still has various cells in both areas in different stages of organization. The investigation into the Damascus Gate attack has yet to determine the scope of the organization, whether the terrorists had accomplices who harbored them or drove them to the scene and who supplied them with weapons. The only thing that's clear so far is that none of them had any known affiliation with any of the major terrorist groups. It seems no one had recruited them to carry out the attack. It was an independent initiative. The question of motive also remains unanswered at this point in time. There is no shortage of youths in Judea and Samaria who are just like Wednesday's three assailants. And Kabatia, home to those terrorists, has a long history of spurring violence. In fact, hundreds of Palestinians involved in terrorist activities since the first intifada have called the Janine adjacent village their home, including six terrorists involved in the current hostilities. Terrorism, of course, is nothing without its copycats. Terrorists have the tendency to repeat patterns of assault, especially those proven successful. For example, early in the current wave of terrorism, there was a series of stabbing attacks in Jerusalem, followed by a series of ramming attacks in the capital. The security crackdown shifted the terrorist focus to Hebron, which saw a prolonged bout of violence before the focus shifted again, this time taking the shape of terrorist infiltrations into Judea and Samaria communities. Israel must calculate its next steps carefully if it seeks to avoid further escalation. The defense establishment's main effort at this time is to curtail the killing spree, thus reducing the number of Palestinians who rush to repeat terrorist attacks. 
The natural concern is that Palestinian youth will try to launch more complex terrorist attacks, combining knives, firearms, and explosives, like the trio at the Damascus Gate, with the sole intent of killing as many Israelis as possible. On the one hand, an organization of this nature may prove easier to uncover, as, it pl as its plans require equipment, coordination, and travel all steps that would enable the Shin Bet to gather intelligence and thwart danger. But on the other hand, such an organization entails far deadlier potential, and in the absence of prevention, each attack may result not only in casualties, but also in further, further security escalation. Since the onset of the current wave of terrorism in October, Israel has been careful to avoid two key issues, namely harming innocent Palestinians and undermining the coordination with Palestinian security forces. The former seeks to maintain the Palestinian fabric of life and minimize their desire to join the cycle of violence. And the latter seeks to retain the Palestinian Authority as a functioning entity, as well as ensure its security forces undercut terrorism of their own volition. After all, destabilizing or disbanding the Palestinian security forces may push some of its troops into dangerous corners. A mass casualty attack, or a series of them, may force Israel to deviate from its plan. Changes to current operational procedures will require imposing various limitations on the Palestinian population, both as a punitive action as well as one meant to generate deterrence. Such measures will undoubtedly lead to the Palestinians to pressure Ram the Ramallah government which in turn will become more adversarial toward Israel. Should Hamas be the one instigating such attacks, this process could prove even more dangerous. An example of how quickly things can spiral out of control dates back as recently as the summer of 2014, when the abduction and murder of three Israeli teenagers in Judea and Samaria led to a series of Israeli moves that culminated in Operation Protective Edge in the Gaza Strip. The current situation is similar, as an incident that begins in Israel or in Judea and Samaria could end with another military campaign on the southern border. Hamas is not interested in a confrontation at this time, but that does not stop it from gearing up for a new round of hostilities. The change in the balance of power between Hamas's political and military wings was evident to anyone paying attention to a recent speech by Hamas political leader in Gaza, Ishmael Haneya, whose belligerent rhetoric made him sound less like a politician and more like a general. The aggressive tone indicates that Hamas understand that fresh fighting in Gaza may erupt at any moment. This is also why Hamas is sparing no effort to rebuild its grid of terror tunnels as it fully plans to use it to exact a heavy price from Israel. This shift in the potential escalation it harbors for both Judea and Samaria and the Gaza Strip mandates that Israel goes back to the drawing board and ask itself what it really wants from the Palestinian Authority, from Hamas, and on a wider spectrum from the Arab nations and the West. Such discussions have been taking place in the defense establishment, but not in the cabinet where some ministers are busy reprimanding military commanders, sometimes in the ugliest of ways, and searching for micro-tactic solutions, as if they were the commanders in the field and not the policy makers. This process is dangerous not only because it distorts the systems involved, but because it lacks the in-depth discussion that could prevent the situation from escalating further, and if, heaven forbid, it does, to emerge victorious. Hey, wow. I want to show you guys a picture. And I'm just going to tell you this really briefly. This uh, happened over in Judea and Samaria. Some Torah scrolls that were in a tent. They're suspecting Palestinian arsonists, of course, and they just burn them all up. There you go. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell you what Naftali Bennett said. It's like reminiscent of the darkest history of all. Mm -hmm. And we cannot forget. That's mm. what it's like to them. This mm -hmm. is this. These are things that happened 70 years ago during the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. No, folks, we can't turn a blind eye. But yes. we can tell you we love you, and thank you for standing with us. We'll see you on Wednesday. And pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm.